Well, we're so glad that you could join us for this time of worship. As you can see, uh, for our church family, we love celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. A big month here, big week in the first week of May. So we're so excited to that. And we look forward to the day when we can see each other face to face. And yet we're grateful for this opportunity to be able to worship together. Uh, we've been moving through a series, within a series, if you will. We're in Philippians and just was so struck by this topic of anxiety and peace and peace of mind that just felt compelled uh, to, to move into chapter 4 and look at this. We spent, uh, spent uh, two weeks already and we'll spend uh, this week and one other looking at these amazing Themes. I want to just give a quick caveat on the topic of anxiety and uh, talked about this the first week uh, that we started the series and uh, if you're just jumping in for any one of these you may not have heard it but I think it's important to say that we really do need balance on this subject because uh, there are a number of believers that do struggle with anxiety and I think trying to uh, have balance on this on the one hand not, uh, not over spiritualizing on this issue, and uh, in some cases, uh, just uh, guilting or, or making people to feel bad for uh, a struggle that they have. And on the other, not uh, removing God from the equation or not allowing what God and his word has to say on such an important topic. If, uh, if you need help in this area, I encourage you to get it, but be mindful of how that help fits in with your, with your faith experience. This last couple of weeks, we've been looking at this issue of anxiety, and we've found that we are uh, the most anxious nation as that's measured in the world, and uh, not something that we uh, are super proud of. Um, we see that depression is actually increasing generation by generation, that uh, with each uh, generation that passes, we're three more likely to be depressed, um, that we're more medicated as a nation than we've ever been, and that these are issues that are, are pressing in on us, uh, and that we have, this is a pressing issue, we have a problem that we need to solve, and a lot of it filters into our thinking, which is going to be our focus this morning, and uh, that we have a thinking problem. And, uh, and it's, it's something that has uh, really come to be a crescendo. Uh, a believer and a mathematician uh, said this, and I think it's so true, that all of man's problems stem from our inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Some other people have said it this way, to be alone with your own thoughts can be one of the more frightful things that uh, we ever face. In fact, many people go to great extremes to never think about their life. One of the individuals who had survived the Holocaust, uh, Frankel, wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he coined a term, which I think is kind of interesting, he called it Sunday neurosis, that we have a, a neurotic experience on Sunday. And he said it's that kind of depression which afflicts people who become aware of the lack of content in their lives when the rush of a busy week is over and the void within themselves become manifest. And I ask the question, is there such a thing as COVID neurosis? Where, where because of social distancing, because of the inability to do many of the things that people would normally want to do, and maybe for some they say we're going to ignore the restrictions because we can't, stand it. But if you remember life before COVID, you remember sometimes for people on weekends, they would have such a ferocious pace to their play that they would come to the end of a Sunday and they're exhausted. And why is that? Why are we having such a ragged pace? Why would we have Sunday neurosis? It's because it can be a scary thing to be alone with your thoughts. And why is that? Because for many, our thought life is not what it should be. Psychologists are seeing a massive uptick in this problem, that negative thinking is something we all engage in from time to time, but constant negativity can destroy our mental health, can leave us depressed and anxious. Science shows us that positive thinking on the, on the opposite con uh, Contrary-wise, that positive thinking can improve our mental well-being, minimize our stress, can lead to better cardiovascular health, and yet many of us get stuck 
following patterns of negative thinking. Is, this is a, a massive problem for many of us, even believers. We can just get stuck in these patterns of negative thinking at, that drive us and compel us. And it's into this din. It's into this mess that the word of God comes. And so I want to invite you this time, this Sunday, to, to quiet your heart, to quiet your mind, and to invite God into this area, this very pressing set of problems of our thinking. So let's, let's pray and invite God into this time. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak into our minds. We ask for the renewing of our minds that can come as we place ourselves under your authority. Lord Jesus, we want to sit at your feet, that you would be our teacher. Lord, for those that are struggling even right now to calm themselves, I pray that you would just give a supernatural sense of peace and calm as we go to your word that your word would accomplish everything that you want for it to do in our lives. And we commit this time of worship and reflection to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and turn to God's timeless truth. And instead of uh, just looking at what happens in our emotional life and in our thought life, uh, it's so important for us to to read that. So we're going to continue on in Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have your Bibles at home, it's okay. Pause and go get them and open them up. I think it can be so helpful to read this in your own Bible. If you don't have one, um, you can read along with us on the screen from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is anything excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So there it is. Just two verses. Not that much, actually, but it leads us to this big idea. Again, a very simple big idea. Peace flows from life-giving thinking. There is thinking that is not life-giving. There's thinking that literally destroys us. And there's thinking that gives life. And peace, a life of peace, flows out of that. So this enormous area, for many Christians... This area of our thought life is something that Scripture talks about a lot. But it's something that we often don't think about. We think, we think about a lot of things, but we don't think about our thinking. And uh, it's the lack of thoughtfulness about our thought life that allows for many bad habits to grow. So I want to invite you to dive deeper into what the Word of God says. That's what we're going to do now. That our thinking can create a peaceful life, a life uh, that's uh, a fertile ground for God to work. So let's go ahead and go through his word. Uh, The first thing, I think, um, is just placing this in context in the series. Again, if you've been with us week to week through this, you'll see that there's multiple aspects. The first week we talked about this, coming out of chapter 4, is the command to be joyful, and that being joyful is a choice. That we can rejoice, we can choose to rejoice in the Lord. We looked last week at this idea that that we can, instead, we can turn away from our anxieties and embrace a life of prayer, praying about the things that we would be anxious for. This week, we're going to look at our thought life, and next week, we'll wrap up this little four-part series looking at Paul's journey in being content and what it is to be content, even in adverse circumstances. So the, this journey to peace and moving away from anxiety towards peace is really multifaceted. This week we'll focus on thought life. I think one of the things that comes out right away is maybe a surprising, uh, a surprising truth, but it's woven into the very fabric of thought of this passage is rejecting relativism. You'd say, where's relativism in this passage? 
The grammar of this passage demands the idea that there are things that are good and there's things that aren't. There's things that are excellent and there's things that are not excellent. There's things that are life-giving and there's things that will suck the, the very life out of your soul. And uh, the, the very categories that there are good things and there are bad things uh, rejects this, this notion of relativism that has become so common. Maybe that term is familiar to you. Maybe it's not. Relativism is this idea that's become very popular. And in fact, not to embrace relativism for some is simultaneous with arrogance. Like if you're not a relativist, then you're just arrogant. But it's this idea that all truth is relative, except for that truth, which is universal. And, uh, and this idea that it's your truth, and then there's my truth, and that's true for you, but it's not true for me. And uh, it's, it's arrogant and offensive, it's intolerant to foist your truth onto someone else. Again, except for that truth, that all truth is relative. That truth can be foisted on everyone. Uh, and it's just one of these ideas that's become very common. It, it flies in the face of this passage. This passage assumes that there's things that are good and there's things that are not. There's things that, uh, that, that are morally excellent and there's things that are, that are not. Now, I think one of the things about relativism is it really breaks down because it's, it's only in certain spheres of life. You know, there's lots of reality where a relativist doesn't act like a relativist at all. And, and this has been pointed out in many contexts. You know, you come to a street light and you really hope the relativist isn't a relativist about the red light. You know, and they're not when other people cut them off. It's quite interesting, actually. When it comes to ethics, most relativists do not have uh, a relative understanding of ethics. They have a very robust understanding of how they want people to treat them. Uh, and it's not uh, just, uh, oh, that's true for you. I was thinking about it in something else. You know, when we think of just a sphere of life that's common, I don't know if this has happened to you. When uh, do you ever do the smell test, uh, you know, you can do the smell test on a shirt. You know, you're like, you know, oop, that one's ready for the laundry. I remember as a college student, that was the, the test. And, and uh, maybe my sense of smell wasn't what it should be. Some, some things should have maybe failed the smell test. Uh, you know, and then there's the refrigerator smell test. Have you ever had it where you're stuffing stuff in there and then there's something in the back that I don't know how it got stuck back there, but you open it up. And uh, it's, it's just not a good smell, you know, and it's growing. Uh, I know my, my kids used to grow, joke that, that, uh, that the, there's so much, there's a new form of life that's growing out of that thing. And, and, uh, and you're like, just could you imagine being a relativist? You're like, well, that's spoiled for you, you know, but that's your culturally bound notion of freshness. Uh, you know, and you're like, okay, well, you can eat it and you might get botulism, you know, or whatever. But, uh, you know, it, when it comes to trash, when it comes to something that's rotten or wretched or is, or is just completely spoiled, we'd say it's not just a relative concept. There's things that are good and there's things that are rotten. And the, even the relativist is going to take things out of their fridge, smell it, and go, oh my goodness, that's disgusting, and, and throw it away. And so I think, you know, when Pilate asked Jesus what is truth, the, the, the whole presupposition of this passage is that there are things that are actually good and there's things that are actually not. And uh, yes, there's judgment calls, and yes, there's perspective, but in the end, there are objective moral realities that this passage appeals to us to use our discernment about. And so, we're asked to identify things that are worth thinking about. Again, the presupposition is that there are things that are worth thinking about, and there's things that are not worth thinking about. And we're told to identify this. So we go back to our passage and say, finally, brothers, he's going to be summarizing. He'll spend the whole chapter uh, with some additional thoughts uh, and uh, say, whatever is true. Again, the, the grammar here assumes that there are true things. And whatever is honorable, because there's honorable things. Whatever is pure, because there are pure things. Whatever is lovely, because there are things that are lovely. 
And there's things that are commendable. And there's things that are excellent. And so he proceeds from this, this presupposition. So we, we need to think about these things. Let's spend some time looking at this list. I think the list is translated very well. Each of the words means about, you know, you can, sometimes you think, oh, if only I knew the original language, you can dive in. And then in this case, you're just like, yep, that's actually what all those words mean. You know, there's no secret hidden nuance you missed. You know, what does it mean to be true? It's just like, yep, it's true. It's right. It corresponds to reality, corresponds to the way things really are. Again, this assumes that there are things that are true and, and things that are false, uh, but, but, of course, so does relativism, because if truth is relative, then it's that and not another thing. And so it, it's also an exclusive truth claim and isn't relative either. And truth is something that, that describes the way things really are. We have things that are, that are honorable, things that, in, in this idea of, of majestic or awe-inspiring, things that are worthy of honor. Like things that should be honored. Now, not everything in our culture that is honored should be honored. But, but this is saying that there are things that are actually honorable. There's things that are just. And, and there's actual justice. I think uh, inside of us, there's, there is something that happens. A visceral reaction that can happen when, when you experience injustice. When, when someone gets away with murder, literally, or, or when something happens, there, there is a response. And often cases, there can be riots, there can be extreme responses to injustice. I think as children, uh, it's interesting. You don't have to teach, teach them this. They, their sense of morality can be offended. And it's like, that's not fair. And uh, you're like, well, who taught you to be upset about that? It's just in there. Now, granted, when it's not fair to me, it bothers me us more than than when it's not fair to others um, but th there is this sense of justice the sense of right it's equitable it's fair it advances uh, what God knows to be right and true and then it's pure and uh, th there is there are things that are morally pure and there's things that are morally filthy there's toxic waste for your soul and there's things that are pure there's things that are that are that are life giving, and uh, and that are that you're able to to be able to take it in, and there's no there's no problem, there's no there's no difficulty with that. And there's things that are lovely. This is the idea of of give satisfaction. It's pleasurable. It's attractive. It's it's just something that's lovely and wonderful. There's things that are that are excellent uh, and commendable. There's things that are worthy of praise this is an interesting one this is worthy of praise now there's a lot of things that are praised that are not worthy of praise uh, that a lot, we, we praise a lot of things uh, in fact this this is a fascinating area to dive deeper in if you want to study this all cultures worship something all people worship something even atheists worship things uh, you can and and uh Lewis and others have written on this, that the act of praising actually gives us completion. That, that we want to praise something. If you, if you go to a restaurant, I know right now we're not doing that as much, and you really like it, it, have you ever noticed how much joy people get from praising something? Like, oh, you gotta try this. It's so good. Uh, you know, like, oh, that's so delicious. If you have a recipe that's amazing, you know, and you're like, oh, have you guys had this? You have to, if you see a film or something you really, really enjoy, it actually gives you more joy to talk about it and to praise it. If you really enjoy a person, you want to praise them. And, and this is why for believers, the act of praise and worship is essential. Like we have to do it. Because uh, our completion, our joy, and it's like, have you met Jesus? He's amazing. And uh, we're going to worship him. We're going to praise him. And you take our worship and praise away, and uh, it, it's just completely different. Now, there's things that are worthy of praise, and there's things that are not. A lot of things in our culture are praised. They're not worthy of praise, but we praise them anyway. And uh, we'll praise athletes, and we'll praise all kinds of people, um, and a lot of talk shows uh, are constantly 
arguing over who deserves well, more praise. And, and uh, I was always struck by that, like, you know, uh, sports radio. It was a constant, like, barbershop arguments. Like, who's the greatest? You know, Michael Jordan versus, you know, and we're just going to argue forever over who gets more praise than who and who ranks it. Uh, just this last week, Isaiah Thomas said that Michael Jordan was like the fourth best player ever. And people are like, what? You know, how could you possibly say that? And we're going to have arguments over whether he was fourth best or third best or the very best. And, and you just think, okay, you know, is this really a big deal? But we want to praise and we're going to praise. But are we praising things that are worthy of praise? And... Uh, Quick note about in this passage, if you noticed it, uh, the ifs. So you had a, a series of grammatical constructions that were whatever. Whatever is, you know, and normally you say whatever, like it's a blow off. Like whatever, that's not it. This is assuming that there is that thing, okay? So whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is, and then it switches to if. And uh, some will ask, you know, why the switch? You know, is that, what does that mean? Does that mean anything? Does that mean the last three items that are mentioned with the if? He's not sure if those really are there. Like he, he assumes the others exist and then the ifs he's not sure about. Um, if you're with us earlier in this series, in chapter 2, uh, we looked at a series of ifs, which I commented on then grammatically could be translated since because the grammar assumed that they're there. Uh, that's not the case here. These are true pure conditionals. So then the case is, so why? Why would Paul do that? Why would Paul have a list of eight things? The first five, he says, are whatever, and then the last three are if. Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, I, think that, I think the answer is that Paul is putting the, the burden on us. Uh, I think he's shifting the burden to us to make the decision. So he's saying, you know, whatever is good, then embrace that. And then he's saying to us, if there is anything, he believes that there are, I think. So it's not the case that he doesn't think they exist. I think Paul's shifting the burden on to you to decide, you decide, you know, if there's anything, then seek that. If there's anything like this, then seek that. So I think that's why Paul uses the conditional. It is different than in chapter 2. If you were tracking with us in the sermon series and remember that, that might be more meaningful to you. If not, then just, I think, Paul is shifting the burden onto us. And he says, think about these things. This, this verb is very important. It takes the form of a habitual repeated action. So I think this speaks a lot to what we need to do. This is not a one and done kind of deal. This is like you need to keep getting up every, like, how often do you eat? You know, you're like, oh, I, I ate last month. You know, like, it's good. You know, but what did you eat today? You, you need to keep coming back to this. Habitually think about these things. And this recognizes that our thought life is a constant churning thing. And you're going to be thinking about something. And uh, so uh, it's a call to habitually Keep going back over and over and over again. Uh, and, you, and it recognizes that you're probably going to fall down. You're going to think about things that are not morally excellent. You're going to think about things that are not that pure. You're going to think about things that are not life-giving. But then you're going to stop and you're going to go back and you're going to think habitually about these things. This speaks to spiritual discipline. This is not whenever, whenever it occurs to you, go ahead and think about some of these eight things. This is talking about a spiritual discipline of training our minds to focus intentionally and repeatedly about these life-giving things. Very important. And then, uh, uh, you know, we'll have more, uh, more to happen with that. I want to recommend a book to you. Uh, my wife and I are going through this, The Love Dare. This was real popular um, a few years ago, a movie connected to it as, as well. Um, so what the, what the Love Dare does is it basically just takes this idea of love and then kind of breaks it apart into practical ways. Now, it's intended for couples, but you wouldn't have to use it that way. Um, you could use this with other family relationships. In the book, they talk about two rooms, and I think it's just helpful construction. 
has been for my wife and I. It talks about there's one room over here, and that's the appreciation room. This is, if, if you're applying it to your spouse, this is like all the stuff you love about your spouse. And uh, the things you appreciate, the things that you'd like to, that you would praise them about. And, and typically, earlier in a relationship, a person spends more time in the appreciation room. And uh, isn't that great? And, and maybe even for young couples, others will look at this and this will be even slightly annoying. Like, or, or you'll be like, pat, pat on the head, don't worry, you'll get over that. Uh, because it, you're not always going to be camped out in that appreciation room because there's another room. And he calls it the depreciation room. Uh, Rick and I use a different phrase. We'll just call it the dark room just because it's, it's not a lot of light and not a lot of happy in there. And it's everything you don't like about your spouse. It's everything you find annoying about them. And, uh, and what can happen is you can get stuck in the dark room. You can get stuck in the depreciation room where your, your thoughts just feed negativity, and then the negative thoughts feed negative patterns of behavior. You can start to complain and gripe and get bitter and resentful, and then those actions don't call forth uh, usually real good things, and if you respond in kind, uh, it can become a, a habitual cycle. Uh, other marriage authors have done tons of research on this, and uh, one of the greatest predictors of divorce, Gottman found, is uh, whether you're in this dark room or not, whether, whether you, how much time you spend there. And, uh, and so this is, I think, uh, another application of this, uh, that which, which room are you in? Are, are you in the appreciation room? Are you in, uh, you know, are you in the dark room? Where, you know, and you can do this, you can do this with anything. You can do this with church. Right? Do you do you love your church? Do you do you do you say oh the, the 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 great things, or are you in the dark room with regard to the church or with regard to your siblings? Let me just normalize this. If if you're experiencing as a family some increased tension levels with COVID, let me just say that's completely normal. That's completely normal. You're gonna see increased marital tension, uh, and you're gonna see some family friction that you might not have seen and it all depends on what your family rhythms are maybe this hasn't been that disruptive but i think for many uh they're going to find that that's going to increase this and how much time do you spend in each of these different rooms i found it helpful i would recommend the book uh, and uh, I think you could do it again with lots of relationships for rebecca and i i think it's very helpful it just takes this word love and demystifies it a bit and, and gives you practical things to work on through some of the, the most beautiful passages of Scripture, talking about love, of course, 1 Corinthians 13 being one that has a lot to say about it. And then we're told that we can find, uh, find a great copy uh, in, you know, and that we can respond to, to this in modeling because this gives us something that he says for us to do, right? So whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So we're told them to model, uh, to model what they'd seen in Paul. So this calls us to multiply our influence in the lives of others. Now for some, this I think introduces a problem. So we're going to ask a question and answer. Is this arrogant? It kind of seems like it maybe. You're like, you know what you should do is you should copy me because the world would be a better place if it was filled with a lot more people like me. And if you were like me, you'd be better. I don't know. It can sound arrogant, right? It can, it can sound like, wow, I think I've arrived. And so is it arrogant? I'm saying no, it's not. And so let me just kind of hit pause and just widen the lens out for a little bit more. And we'll look at this idea of imitating uh, because there's this idea, this is how Paul uses this, and it's not just Paul, it's other authors as well. But he says to imitate him in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, he says that. But then in 11, 1, he also says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, which is the pattern. So it's not just that we should all be a lot like Paul. We should be like Paul to the extent that Paul's like Jesus. And that Paul is striving to be like Jesus. And if you if you tie this into other broader Christian teaching, the idea that we're all to be in a transforming relationship and 
the second letter to Corinthians, Paul says that, that we're all being transformed into the glorious image of Christ from glory to glory into his perfect image. And so that we're all to be in a process of being transformed. And we follow Paul as he follows Christ. We can follow other Christians as we follow. But then he also says to imitate us. And he means by that in the context, the broader team that Paul had. He means Timothy. He means Tychicus. He means Titus. He means uh, Epaphroditus. These different people that were on Paul's team. So it wasn't just him. It was a broader group of Christians, but it is bigger than that. He would say, imitate the churches of God. Imitate all the churches. And then he would say, imitate God in Ephesians 1. So it isn't just about Paul. It's, it's about uh, imitating believers who are following Christ. And, and this, this calls us to a life of, of modeling. So I think this is crucial to Christianity, and this is something that I think uh, the church has gotten away from a bit. In some cases, discipleship has turned into something very systematic, very knowledge-based, like I'm going to go to a bunch of classes, or I'm going to read a book about discipleship. When you look at discipleship in the, in the New Testament, it's very life on life. And this is very much the way of Jesus, and this is the way of the apostles. Uh, that it's one life touching another. And this is central really through the essential stewardships of the church in evangelism, sharing our faith. It's one life sharing your faith with another, with a coworker or with a neighbor or with a friend or with a relative. You're sharing your life journey. You're saying, come follow me as I follow Jesus. You're inviting them to come and see, just as the original disciples were. Come and see Jesus. In community, you're doing that. You're saying, hey, we're trying to experience the one and others. We want to experience community. Come with us. Come join in that. In discipleship, you're inviting someone to join in a life of obeying and following up Jesus. The same thing's true in raising up leaders. That, that you're, you're raising up leaders. Leadership development is supposed to be ultimately rooted in relationship. Where, where you're calling up leaders, existing leaders, identify and cultivate and call up future leaders and saying, hey, we see this in you. We believe you have a potential. We see giftedness in you that we want to call up and cultivate and uh, commend you to. So this idea of life on life and modeling uh, and calling people to join in a journey is central to Christianity. And then we have this promise, this promise that you will have peace by having a deeper experience with the God. It says, and the God of peace, again, this calls us back to this idea, it's God's peace. So he doesn't just say, I'm going to give you a deposit of peace, or I'm going to give you a little injection of peace. And it's saying that you'll be drawn into a deeper relationship with this God who is a God of peace. And this is very similar to what Jesus says. My peace I give to you. And earlier in the same passage, the peace of God. And it's God's peace. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus here. It's the God of peace will be with us. And as we draw nearer to God and the God of peace, we will become more peaceful. Okay, so let's linger in application here. Because again, this big idea is pretty easy to understand. That we can experience peace through life-giving thinking. That's not that hard to understand. That, that our thinking creates a pathway to peace. Okay, we can understand that. Let me just say again that uh, I think as Christians, sometimes we get in a bad habit of just saying, okay, I understand that, let's move on. But I want to, here's the framework I'm holding up, is what is God's word giving us? What is God calling us to? What is, what is the, the word of God saying, this is what I want for you? And then we look at what is our present experience, okay? So what is God's word calling us to here? A transcendent experience of his peace where we focus on good things, excellent things, pure things, wonderful things that give us life and connect us in deep and profound ways to a God of peace. That's what he wants for us. 
We go back to the beginning. What is our experience? We're the most anxious nation in the world. We're more medicated than we've ever been. We're more depressed than we've ever been. Believers are struggling with this. So there is a gap between what God wants for us and what our present experience is. Application is where we intentionally try to close that gap. It's no good as a believer to nod your head to God's word and say, oh yeah, that's good, that's good, you know, and then not do anything about it. If there's a massive gap between what God's calling us to and what we're presently experiencing, then we obey God's word by intentionally trying to close that gap. How do we do that? Reject relativism. You're like, what would that look like? I need, you need to search your heart. This is kind of insidious. This is like weeds for your soul and for your mind. You're like, how did that weed get there? <laughs> Rebecca and I are reclaiming some land that we let go. And it's like, it's crazy how much stuff is growing there. We we're like pulling stuff out and chopping it down and hauling it away. We're like, why? Things we're trying to grow aren't doing that well. And things that we do not want to be there are doing quite well, unfortunately. This is like relativism. Search your heart. Does the idea that there are really excellent things, does that bother you? And just saying, you know what? No, it's not a matter of personal opinion or taste. That there is trash and there's something that's good. There's something that's pure. Morally, it's pure. And there's stuff that's like toxic waste for your soul. And if you drink it, you're going to die. And it just that there are two categories in the end. And I think for some, we've gotten so used to this idea of your truth and their truth. And like that, that there would be an objective set of categories of things that are really excellent and things that are worthless. Things that should be praised and things that should never be praised. That that's offensive. If it's offensive to you, let me suggest to you that the weed of relativism is growing in your heart and you need to pull it out. You need to do some work there. Identify patterns of thought in your life. What do you think about and for how long? How much do you think about bad things? Things that don't give life. It, things, you can start getting fixated on certain ideas and, and, and you can just run away with it. And people don't even think about what they're thinking about. How much do you think about these eight things that we talked about? Things that are pure, that are life-giving, that are excellent, that are praiseworthy. How much actual time do you spend thinking about that? In marriage, how much time do you spend in the appreciation room? One of the exercises in that love dare was just write down everything you appreciate and then you wrote down the other list and then later you threw that list away. <laughs> but I'm telling you, for me, just for me, okay, writing down the appreciation list was joyful. It was like, yeah, this is all the stuff I love about my wife. And later you picked one thing from there and then you communicated how much you appreciate this aspect. And it was fun just thinking about which one will I share and and because uh, I could share this one, I could share that one. And just that, ass, just that exercise was joyful. If you're married, do this. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, if you're stuck in the dark room in your marriage and it's just like negativity all the time and griping and complaining and all things you don't like, get out of that room. Get into the appreciation room. Again, you can do this with other relationships. If you're not married right now, you'd be like, Shh, I don't have to do anything. Oh, yes, you do. You can have uh, the same thing with your siblings, the same thing with other relationships. And so how much time do you spend fixating on negative things within your family? And uh, it, it can be something uh, along those lines. Look at the list of eight. I'm going to ask, where do you find these things? Identify the sources. Where do you find pure things? Where do you find things that are worthy of praise? Where do you find that? Literally, where do you find them? On the internet? In good books? Identify where you find them and cultivate that and grow that. I, I think if you just take your hands off the wheel here, it's not going to lead you to these eight things. It's not going to lead you. If you do not exercise discipline over your mind, your mind is not going to naturally just fall on pure and excellent and praiseworthy things. So you need to identify where do I find these things and, and then go to them more often intentionally. 
access those, read those. It might be biographies. Uh, it might be you know, just some, some, some heroes of the faith that did things well. Examples that you could hold up and say, okay, I'm going to strive. I know they're not perfect. I know that. But they did, it. They, they, they did a good job. Maybe it's people who made a difference in society, like grab Wilberforce or somebody and, and say, how did they do it? How did they help end slavery? And, and you're going to you know, look at someone's life who, who, who did something excellent. I, I, I think we need to do some repentance here. Let's be honest. I think for some of us, we need to repent of fixating on moral rot and decay. If you take the inverse of the eight commendable things, how much time do we spend thinking on things that are untrue? The enemy lies to us, and we traffic in lies. Are there things that are not just, they're unjust? How much time do you look at injustice? How much time do you look at things that are morally filthy? And it's not a judgment call. It's absolutely the case. Morally, it's filthy. It's teeming with disease that would kill you. How much time do we spend things that are not commendable? Things that should not be praised. And the reality is, I think if you just take your hands off the wheel, if you just watch the news, the news is going to give you tons of these things. Things that are not commendable. I remember listening to an interview about a leader in the media, and he was talking about what is news and what is not. And he just kind of made up some numbers and just said every day, let's just say 10 million buses, I know this isn't true now because they were in COVID, but it was true then in the interview. So let's, say every, let's just say every day 10 million buses get, get home safely. He said that's not news. You know, 10 million kids getting home safely, that's not news. The one bus in Texas where the driver had a heart attack and careened out of control and six kids died, that's news. You know, and there's something profoundly wrong with that. If, if the 9,999,000, that's not news. That's never news. You know, that they got home safely and maybe God, in 15 cases, provided a miracle which protected them. That's not news. What's news is the six that died. And if that's all we're reading and all we're imbibing, it's like whatever is depressing and whatever is hard and whatever is sad and whatever is trashy and not commendable, that's what we're going to ingest nonstop, 24-7. Is there any reason to wonder why we're depressed? It's almost like if, if this was the exact opposite, we'd do a lot better obeying it. Whatever is hard and sad and depressing and dark and not life-giving, that and just 24-7. So some of this might just be repentance. Some of you need to maybe stop watching the news. Decide how much you're going to watch and how much you're going to read. How much is enough? An hour? Two hours? And then is there something beautiful and wonderful and life-giving and pure that you can fill in there? I think let's not miss this, and many Christians do, I think you can describe what this is in just this one phrase. Find one, be one. That every Christian should have those that they're, that they're looking up to. And even those that are further along in the faith, that doesn't mean you don't have anyone you can look up to. Oftentimes, we can lose things we once had. Uh, and this is where the generations need each other. But every Christian should be reaching back and just saying, hey, come follow me as I follow Jesus. I am not perfect. You'll see that. This is not arrogant. To obey Jesus is not arrogant. You're not saying you're perfect. You're saying, come follow me. Maybe someone's just curious about Jesus. The original call of discipleship was linked to evangelism. Oftentimes we made those two separate things. They're not. It was, come see Jesus. Are you curious about him? Even the original disciples, they weren't sure who Jesus was. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Come see. Come with me. Come walk this way. I'm going to follow Jesus. Come follow me. So it's evangelism. It's discipleship. It's leadership development. Be a blessing to those that don't know Jesus yet, but will through you. Also find a life that calls you up. Be that someone for something else. I think as an as a American church, we've gotten away from this. We've made it so organized that we've gotten away from the organic expression of being one and finding one. 
uh, it's amazing. Like there's disciple making movements as a thing and missions around the world. And if you look at the, what, how'd you do it? How did exponential growth happen? It was this. <laughs> People were found one and they were one. Everyone, every Christian, not a few special forces Christians or pastors, but every single Christian was like, I'm going to follow and I'm going to take someone with. And I'm going to share my faith and I'm going to draw them along. And that's how movements happen. Be a disciple maker. Multiply your life and your influence in others. The numbers are pretty consistent, like 90-something percent, 95, 97 percent of people come to faith through someone they know. Not through a rally, not through the television, not through, they come through someone, their friend, their neighbor, their coworker, uh, someone they know, someone they trust. And so you can be that for someone else. And enjoy the promise of God here. And it says, in the peace of God that flows from enjoying his presence and a morally excellent thought life. What you think about matters. If God feels far away from you, it might have to do with what you're thinking about. And here it says, like, God will be near when our thoughts are excellent. And when our thoughts are not excellent, he will feel far. Sometimes God can feel far. Not all the time. Not all the time. Sometimes God feels far because we're thinking about things that don't please him. Have you ever been in the room in a conversation that's so offensive you just want to leave? It's just the, the whole thing's so yucky. <laughs> Big word. It's just so yucky that you're like, I got to just leave. That's how God feels sometimes about what we think about. The, 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 the whole atmosphere in that room is so disgusting and obnoxious that God just wants to get up and remove himself. Some of that distance is the product of a morally rotten thought life and a beautiful thought life conversely calls God in and we will experience his nearness and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will be our experience. Let's just end as I typically do imagining a little bit what it would look like if we really grabbed hold of this and this life-giving truth. Could you imagine with me what would happen if a Christian who, was, who loves Jesus but got stuck in patterns of negative thinking and it just spiraled and the more negative, the more negative it got, the more dark it got and they all of a sudden stopped because God's word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit grabbed hold of their heart. And instead of tumbling from negative thing to negative thing, they grabbed hold of the truth of this. And they said, you know what? Whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is good and just and life-giving, I'm going to focus on that. And they started to turn their mental thought life and all of a sudden, they didn't feel so depressed because they weren't constantly ruminating on depressing things. And all of a sudden, they, they didn't even need to take as much medication as they had before. And they started engaging in life-giving habits and patterns. And they started talking with people more and walking more and seeing beautiful, good things. Because part of the good things they saw was God's wonderful created world. Could you imagine a Christian who had started slipping into relativism, who are, almost started thinking like, well, that's your truth, but that's not my truth, and, and everything's a judgment call. Maybe that's not pure for you, but it's pure for me. And over time, they started ingesting spiritually poisonous things, and they were sick and weak and not healthy because they believed it was all kind of up for grabs. And the categories and the clarity of God's word called them to conviction, and they realized this is not just a judgment call. That there's things that are decomposing and are rotten and I'm eating them and it's hurting me and I need to stop. And they did. And they started feeling better because they stopped eating spiritual poison. Could you imagine with me a Christian or even a whole church that decided to obey God's call to find one and be one? And instead of thinking as evangelism or discipleship as a program, instead of them thinking of it as something that those people over there do, that the entire church started to open up their eyes to the harvest field that's around them and, and organic expressions of evangelism and discipleship became normal. And people started coming to faith and people started growing in their faith. 
And it wasn't just going to another Bible study, but it was life-transforming truth that gained root. Can you imagine what that would look like? My prayer is that God would do that in our midst. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would do your word among your people and among those that don't yet know you. Lord, I pray for those that are stuck and are held captive by negative patterns of thinking. And certainly the enemy of our soul it plays a role here. Lord, I pray for those that are anxious and are discouraged and depressed and are stuck in dark places. Lord, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would be able to give them victory. I pray for those that need help doing that would get the help they need. I pray for those that have been shamed and uh, who have been giving uh, negative messages by Christians in the past that there would be healing where there needs to be healing. Lord, for those that are struggling with fear over this COVID, I pray that you would bring victory. We do pray, Lord, for our country. Think of the 60,000 plus that have lost their lives to this disease and the many others who have been impacted by it in all sorts of ways. For those that are out of work, and don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. Lord, we pray that you would be their provider and that you would carry them through. Lord, for those that are walking a journey of illness, for those that are in the hospital right now, for those that are walking the hospice journey, Lord God, we ask that you would be near to them and that your nearness would be their good. We pray this passage, Lord, that they would experience your presence and that your presence would give them peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, would you guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray all these things and many others besides. In your name we pray, amen. We invite you to join us next week as we continue this series in Philippians. God bless.